Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Koyas Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Koyas Institute. It's really great to have you on. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while because I feel like you balance uh, that fine line between different perceptual lenses when it comes to examining the UFO phenomenon. Obviously, you have your background as a religious scholar, plenty of connections and knowledge in those communities. You also have your connections into the intelligence and the government and communications with insiders and technologists and futurists. So I think it's fair to say you've kind of got a foot in the physical and the metaphysical, which I think is the best place to be to get a wider, more clearer picture of what we might be going through as it relates to uh, non-human intelligence and the interactions that have occurred throughout history. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you so much for having me on your show. You're most welcome. And you also have a new book being published in November, I believe, titled Encounters, Experiences with Non-Human Intelligence. Now, the title's pretty self-explanatory, but could you give people a little bit of an idea of the inspiration behind this book and what people might expect from it? Oh, sure. So um, obviously with American Cosmic, it was my first foray into writing about the topic of UFOs and UAPs. And it was a shocking thing for me because I was not somebody who had believed in UFOs um, previously, basically. And I'd been studying metaphysical and, you know, sometimes physical miraculous phenomena within the Catholic tradition. So, and in a professional way. So as a, as a person who studies academically. So, so I'm not making claims of the truth or falseness of, of these things. I'm studying the cultural consequences and implications of belief and, and things like this. So I was, um, <laughs> I was pretty shocked in 2012 and 2013 to, to come into this community and recognize that there was, you know, whatever, what people were experiencing hundreds of years ago, even a thousand years ago, even 2000 years ago, you know, back a long time ago, these things were still being experienced today. And we have a different framework for understanding them today. So, so it was shocking to me. Um, anyway, so American Cosmic was a wake up for me. And it also took me to some locations that were really specific, uh, like New Mexico and um, I also had an experience that was interesting in that I traveled with Gary Nolan, um, who's well known in the UFO community and in the academic community. And um, I, at the time, this was prior to 2017 and the New York Times exposés by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. And so, um, and so I still was not a believer at all. And we traveled to uh, an alleged UFO crash site in New Mexico, uh, when I say alleged, this these were the one of the crash sites is affiliated with Roswell, like the 1940s crash sites. It wasn't the Roswell crash site, though. So I traveled there with Gary, and um, who was named James in my book, and Tyler, who reminds me in in a lot um, of ways of you know because he's is the similar affiliations, if not exact affiliations, as. Uh, Dave Grush. And so that what was said to Dave Grush was actually said to me, except I was even shown the parts, right? These are the parts and these are where we're, we retrieve them kind of thing. Um, at the time, I, in, you know, I, I understood this in mythological terms as a modern Prometheus myth, literally like Prometheus is the Greek God who gave humans technology back in the day, kind of like, you know, that was their religion, basically. And so I, I consider this to be kind of like a resuscitation of this, almost like an archetypal religion. Um, but I mean, <laughs> back in the day, it was like fire. And today it's these. And so it was a really weird experience for me. There's, you know, no lie. And um, and so I've just been witnessing everything that's been, that's been going on. Encounters is like kind of a part two of that, where... I'm now understanding what's going on. I get the landscape. I get kind of the, you know, disinfo aspect of it. I don't think you can actually do this 
work as an academic without addressing the disinfo because it's been a part of it since the 1940s, even before that. And so, um, so, you know, that was really a difficult thing. I really had to deep dive into understanding how, you know, how that worked and, um, yeah. So, so encounters is, is still looking at communities of people who've had these experiences and these are high functioning people. Um, some of them, most of them keep their names. Uh, they're not, cause I use pseudonyms in American cosmic mostly. And, um, you know, we talked to Dr. Ea Whiteley, who's now working with Ryan Graves on doing kind of helping pilots, um, and soon to be astronauts doing reporting of anomalies and things like that, because the culture of reporting has to change. It's really, it's, you know, it's getting better, but it's still not to the point where it should be. And so I talked to her about her work and I talked to other people similar to her, um, you know, some in, some affiliated with the military, some who are actually on the cutting edge, uh, edge of doing AI, because that's another aspect of this. And, you know, so, so it's a similar type of book. Uh, some people are still in the book, like characters. Um, Tyler makes a small appearance. And uh, I talk more about the work with Jacques Vallée and, and, you know, some of the things that people don't actually focus on within his work, which are esoteric currents within valet and high necks works um so that's that's the book well this is you know this is a part of the the conversation that is not necessarily on the immediate timeline when it comes to government disclosure the the experiences the more uh, ephemeral and, and harder to explain elements of the subjective experience people have with the phenomena and i'm i'm speaking myself as an experiencer i wouldn't actually be in this field or have this platform and, and have done the uh, the interviews that I've done if I hadn't have had my own strange encounters um which changed the direction of my life so I I very much understand that it's a it's a very subjective and and much more controversial area of an already fringe area which we're now trying to destigmatize so I kind of see the the timeline for experiences and sensible discourse in the wider uh, kind of public arena to be a, a bit more of a, a long-term goal but um it's it's good to try and encourage that and uh, and bring these people out because there are as you well know very well experienced people who've uh, who've had sincere encounters definitely and you know dr whiteley actually discusses this um i think she actually may have discussed it on some a podcast but um she definitely is has a conversation about this with me that I put in the book. And it's it's this idea that there are two data sets, right? So there's the data set of the nuts and bolts type of reporting. Oh, I saw this. These are the physical attributes of it. You know, this is what, uh, these are things I observed. And then there's the actual experiences that these people have had with respect to this. And those, both of those data sets don't actually get reported. Or they get reported, but usually to two different people. So she's a space psychologist. So she's, you know, it's her job to basically get all the data, all the reporting. And she's basically seen that, you know, she said, if there's two data sets, it's going to take 40 years to change this culture. And we don't have that time. We need to do it now. So she's right now working on trying to merge the, the ability of people to report so that they feel comfortable reporting the weird stuff as well as the kind of really the the, the uh, observable stuff. And also you, you mentioned something. You said the military disclosure. And I also want to point out that in my opinion, there, there will be and there are go- ongoing different types of disclosures. So when we see this, um, what's happening right now, I've also discussed it as a military type of disclosure. But, you know, there are also there there is a Vatican disclosure, um, but they're not going to do press releases. You know, it's not it's going to be this is this is not how the disclosure of, you know, maybe other countries and other institutions like religious institutions. It's, you know, people who are interested need to be aware of that, that the disclosure that they're expecting. It's going to take a different form for different institutions and everybody's excited about this type of military disclosure 
or what you know whatever they call it um you know because it's it's a site of absolute contention right now and um and i think that you know the things that are going on quietly this is something that i learned with working with tyler d for the years that i worked with him uh is this idea that what's really happening is all the the very important things that are happening the changes that are that are being done they're going to be behind the scenes they're going to be invisible almost you know except for those who can kind of see how to identify and and i think that that's that's really important well like you said it's 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 multiple layers of disclosure different sectors of the population are going to respond to different types of i suppose you could say stimuli on this kind of uh, subject so there's a, an area for the the political national security bureaucratic military kind of speak but then there's all of the spiritual communities and how do they handle it and how does that fit into your belief system so that's definitely something I want to get into with you, especially regarding the Vatican. But in 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 regards to the uh, you know the military disclosure, there's definitely been an acceleration in the last few days as it relates to the the UFO conversation. I mean, most people by now are probably aware of the insider David Grush, who's provided Congress and the Inspector General with uh, classified intelligence relating to, uh, believe it or not, retrieval and reverse engineering programs. That wasn't something I expected right now. I had had people saying that it was coming this year. And I was kind of just patiently holding my breath and, and waiting, but it's uh, it's arrived a little earlier than I expected. So you've had David Grush come out, and he's got a validated background. He said that we have these intact, exotic, non-human vehicles being studied about 48 hours or just under 48 hours um, from when he made these statements. You then have apparently more military insiders and intelligence insiders who haven't given their names yet corroborating this and saying that we have 12 or more vehicles. So there's definitely suddenly been this acceleration. I'm wondering if you have any indication as to, you know, what might be at play here, why the pace is beginning to quicken with the claims of multiple non-human vehicles being studied. I mean, what's your take on all of this right now? Okay, I think that I always urge caution. <laughs> and I know that a lot of people are very excited. Mm -hmm. And, you know, caution is probably not what they're interested in having with respect to this. Uh, but in the history of looking at this, the trajectory of this type of information getting into, you know, um, the public, it, it's helpful to look at the history of it. So what I do is I tend to look at the beginning of the both the Russian and the American space program and the types of things that people aren't going to be, you know, the non-obvious elements. And some of those elements are the place of media as a vehicle for, um, you know, as a vehicle for information dissemination and people like, some of the things that happened to me when I first started to look, and by the way, I do, this was my field before doing this. I looked at popular cultural representations of Catholic belief systems. So I was already prepared to look at how does the information get out to people? Well, for space exploration and rocket technology development, defense related to space, and even, um, things that have to do with flying saucers. You know, if you look at the early 20th century and the 1930s and 40s, um, you do see uh, an affiliation with Walt Disney. <laughs> and at first I thought that was really strange. I mean, uh, I began to look through, I mean, I was looking for anything that I could find on the history, you know, kind of like an, an official history of the Air Force space program here. And you could go to their website and find a lot of stuff. You can even find do digital documents and things like that. So I read all of that I could read. This is in 2012, 2013. And, um, and also they have a lot of material culture um, data, which are photographs. And you see Werner von Braun hanging out with Walt Disney and, you know, this and that. And I thought, Walt Disney, he's really, you know, he's really instrumental here. And why? 
So, um, so I would urge people to think through these connections, which I, you know, explore in American Cosmic, which your audience is most likely familiar with my work, I think, maybe I'm wrong. But, um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about how media informs our understanding of this, I this idea of, you know, UFOs, flying saucers, and things like that. Oh, Dana, Dana, you've got yourself on mute. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. 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 So I have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. No worries. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I think that these are important elements to understand in the current climate, especially because if people who are not interested in UFOs are now talking about them, I mean, that's a huge thing. How was that done? Well, it's done through social media and it's done through the the uh, narrative getting into the popular press. And, you know, so, such that all of my friends who are non-UFO academics or just people I know, they don't care. You know, they're, they're, they, it's not, they're not thinking about it, but now they are. And so the question is, how did that happen? Um, so I think that all of us in the community that look at UFOs and UAPs know that the general population and friends of ours, even maybe brothers and sisters, you know, they, they don't care about. This is something that they just don't think about, but now they're thinking about it. And that's what my friend with the analytics was doing. He was pointing out that, okay, these people have, you know, put in their face constantly, the British Royal family, no offense, <laughs> but you know, it's everywhere. You can't, you can't avoid it. And, you know, and things that we really don't want to think about, but we're forced to think about because it's everywhere. And now UFOs happen to achieve that status. Why? And these are the questions I ask. And is it because we have the, you know, David Grush coming out and with these claims? Not necessarily. It's because those claims have come out before. They came out in my book even. But they're coming out and being shared in major news and if you look at the major news the script is always the same if you read it you know if you listen to it the script is always the same so that when i talk i talk to the major news and i talked to the major news before the pentagon report so a lot of people were asking me you know to have you know my opinion about this or that because i'm a professor and i study this and so what I noticed is that they all asked the same questions and they all wanted to go in the same direction. And that to me is information. So as, as much as they were asking me, I was also identifying how they were being, you know, uh, taught to talk to me. And they were because there were, there were, um, I won't name names, but there were fashion magazines like UK fashion magazines asking me about this. I'm thinking, they in and, and the people who the interviewers from those magazines they didn't care about ufos they didn't want to know about them but they had to do a timeline it was like part of their charge they had to do a timeline and they had to show their readership that this was happening and so i would take pictures of that as as data you know it's kind of okay this is how it's being presented and people don't actually care but now they do because it's it's unavoidable so I think that we have, I mean, honestly, I think we have to think about that. If we're thinking, you know, a lot of people concentrate so much on, is this craft? He says it's this or that, you know, and and all that information was already out there. So I think it's, it's interesting. So these are the things I think about. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, the information was already out there. Um, there's some fantastic testimonies and clips. I posted one up recently on Twitter just as the, a kind of counter to the idea that David Grush is the first one. And it was... Uh, Bob Exler back in the 1980s when he got Admiral Bobby Ray Inman to basically acknowledge on the record that the recovered vehicles might be one day uh, released to the public knowledge, but he has no idea if it would ever happen. And, you know, there's been these types of uh, testimonies from reliable people over the years, and, and now we're seeing David Grush. And I, I, like you, I, I try and tell uh, my audience, because this is how I approach the subject, to just approach everything with a, you know, a degree of skepticism and be cautious, especially when it comes uh, to narratives being propagated by the military industrial complex and the IC and the government. Because 
I think what happens sometimes is we fall into the trap of, well, they're telling me what I want to hear. So I'm just going to eat this up like a kid in a candy store. You know, they've got craft, they've got vehicles, they've been studying it. Finally, I feel vindicated. They're acknowledging it and you dive head first. And I think that it's, it's always good to maybe just look at, try and look a couple steps ahead. Why exactly are they allowing this kind of information to come out? What kind of benefit must it have internally for the IC and the military industrial complex? Because they're not going to deliberately kneecap themselves by saying, yeah, we've been holding it secret this whole time and just let the pitchforks come and, uh, and uh, you know, a revolution kicks off. I don't think that they want to see that kind of disruption. So I would have to imagine that the way in which this is being discussed is a, is a very curated narrative. And although I don't know whether or not it's a ultimately benevolent or benign or malevolent narrative, I try and stay cautious from being uh, kind of sucked up into the frenzy of it. it. It is exciting. I have been sending my family all the clips of David Grush and it, it, it's certainly, <laughs> you know, creating a bit of a frenzy. I mean, my family WhatsApp's popping off going, oh my God, is this really real? It's like, yeah, this is actually happening. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but it is happening. So you're right. No, you're right to 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 view it through the lens that you uh, that you view it, and I think that's the only way you can because there is so much evidence for intelligence interference on this issue. You know, going back several decades, and uh, the the U.S. government and the the kind of collaboration with the media is a historically known fact, and and we know that there's been a lot of falsified narratives over the many decades of this kind of collusion between media and uh, and government. So. To think that that wouldn't be happening with what is really one of the most disruptive, most sensitive, most classified subjects suddenly being discussed in the public domain, you have to imagine they've got the guardrails up and they're, they're doing this in some way to maybe save face or, or, or prepare. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. From my perspective, it definitely seems as if it's... Um... I know that a lot of people want to say this, and believe me, I kind of do too, you know, that this is a, a coordinated disinfo, you know, kind of thing. But from my perspective and knowing people that I know, it seems like it just got out of control. <laughs> hmm. That there was a, a, a desire to get the information out, but that it steamrolled and snowballed. Right. And a lot of people were not prepared for that from the perspective of, I think kind of the, the toothpaste is out of the tube situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's been the case actually since, um, but, but that, that's okay. I mean, you know, this isn't to say that that it's not true. Right. It just means that it's a certain perspective of it. And, you know, and so what I ask in encounters is what's the stuff that's, kind of in not being asked what's the stuff that when you go on you know when you go on a podcast with one of these major people who i'm not saying you're not major but you're asking some questions that most people aren't asking actually and they're not asking those questions on purpose and so i think that um you know i think that that's that's i i, I ask those questions and um and now a lot of people I know are are just want to keep a low profile about it because um, we don't know what's going to happen next. At least I don't. I do know that it's going to keep going, but I don't know how it's going to keep going. Yeah, um, I think that I feel that way about the whole world in general right now. I mean, you know, UFOs is kind of a a, a symptomatic response almost there's so there's so many other things happening around the same time period as this which again makes me think that it could be actually a component of this uh, this green lighting of a disclosure because uh you know i don't know how you feel but i kind of feel like we're staring over a precipice right now on one side is the society we have the values the beliefs the understandings we have and on the other side the side we seem to be kind of stepping closer towards represents some form of transformation process, the amalgamation of artificial intelligence and quantum computation, more advanced models of consciousness, its novel effects, our understanding of parallel worlds and, and dimensions, the increased awareness of non-human intelligences. It just feels like this is the beginning of almost a new chapter. And when you, you know, when you analyze the intuitive and, and the prophetic nature of religious cultures over time with their proclamations of an end time or an epoch or a judgment day 
And you correlate these intuitive kind of prophecies with the more analytical projection from technologists and futurists that we're moving towards a singularity, a, a biosynthetic symbiosis, the birth of an artificial god. It almost feels as if everyone is feeling the same thing, but we're simply translating it through our particular lens of perception. So some see the end time, some see the awakening of human consciousness, some see the birth of an artificial god through AI, but all of these claims have, I suppose, embedded within them, despite their differences, an underlying similarity, which is this feeling that we're transforming, that we've reached a definitive moment in our, in our evolutionary story. So what does your, your intuition and what does your intellect tell you personally? Where does it feel like we're going to you? Okay, that's a really great question and difficult to answer. Very difficult to answer. <laughs> but I'll, 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 you know, and I don't think it can be answered, but I think that we can have a discussion about it. Exactly. And yeah, so, okay. Um, after American Cosmic was was published so re recall that in that book that that person tyler he was always asked by the places where he worked to forecast so one of his jobs was that once a year he would be put into that room called the room of the impossible where you can think anything and he would be told write down everything that you think is going to happen in a five year you know in five years like everything you can think of and so he was doing that because, and, and, and he may not have been the only person to do that. And so he had an ability, what made him so good at his job and um, apparently still good at his job is that he can, he can know things almost like before they happen, right? Because you need that skill for, for space launching and things like that, rocket launching. Um, so they were utilizing him in that way. And after it was published, I I was a, I was um, blessed in a sense to meet more people that were like that, um, even more like that. And they and these people were at the basically the creator had been for 20 years the creators of AI and had a belief system that was similar to his uh, what I would call like a if anybody's interested to follow up on that, the belief system is like the cosmists, the cosmist belief system. Oh, this is this is a Russian thing, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. It's this idea that that he that human evolution is coming to this point. Um, Ray Kurzweil picked up on it when he wrote the book, The Singularity, but he had been around for a while. Yeah. And and it's this idea. So there's the there is an idea uh there is an evolutionary idea that, you know, humans didn't stop evolving, you know, we're still evolving and now we're evolving with technology and that, that we're at that point now where it is exponential. And we do see that. We do see that. Um, and, you know, for, it's an, ex I, we can say that it's a scary time. I tend to see it as a very exciting time. Yeah. I think it's incredible. It's an incredible time to, to witness because, I was actually talking about this with my mother <laughs> and she was saying, you know, she just didn't have this idea, even though she's not r religious and she's very scientific and she's, you know, she has a master's degree in nursing and, you know, so, and she said, you know, I suggested that, you know, humans were evolving at this point with technology and she stopped me and she said, humans are evolving. And I said, well, haven't we been evolving or, you know, don't we do that? And what about natural selection and epigenetic changes? And so it didn't occur to her. But then she thought about it that way and she thought, oh, okay. And she was on board with thinking about this. Um, a friend of mine just gave a talk on AI and its potential and the Doomer idea of AI. And she was bringing this idea to a lot of people who are afraid of AI. And she said, and so she gave them a graph and she said, look at the, the increase in wealth and the increase in, you know, water, fresh water to people and this and that. And she explained that that linkage was, was uh, human flourishing 
had a direct link with technology, right? Technological development. And she, and so they, they kind of were on board, but they still didn't like it. They didn't like AI, didn't like technology. And then she said, okay, here's another way to look at it. Here's some, the, the, the graph of, of money. And let's look at how much money. And do you see that those people who have been using AI now for 30 years or more have been the, the economic industry, the bankers, they've been using AI. So I think it's time, you know, what's wrong with using AI to decentralize money, to decentralize, to bring it for, to people. And, you know, I tend to agree with her with, with respect to that. If AI is here, well, I think we need to, it's not going to, it's like kind of like the UFO disclosure. It's not going back into the bottle, right? It's good. It's out. So AI is out. And it, I think that it, we can actually utilize it. And, and in fact, <laughs> there's nothing, there's not a choice. So I think that, um, I also think it has a lot of, um, implications for this, this, you know, idea of non-human intelligence. Yeah. Although um, I, I will leave my friends, uh, I do talk about it in encounters, but I, I leave that discussion to my friends who are expert at AI because yeah. I'm, I'm not. Well, but it's good to, it's good to ponder about it, especially because like you said, it's so prevalent. It's, it's a, it's a real marker of our position right now in human evolution. We are still evolving. And uh, I think it was Terence McKenna that once said that the uh, the story of the human being is the story of the monkey becoming the flying saucer. And it does feel that way. And I would say that when it comes to technology, you know, since the first time we picked up flint and struck flint to make flame and, and sharpened a stick to make a spear, we've been developing and propagating technology as a uh, as a tool through which we exert our influence over our environment. We've been doing that since the dawn of humanity so you know this is our baby that we've been gestating and we're now giving birth to this this artificial medium so i i have to think to myself that as much as it sounds and seems scary and and could you know go down dystopian narratives and you know it's it's all all, all of our references for it are things like matrix and terminator and blade runner and uh, you know these these uh, scary concepts but you know, I, I try to say to people, at least from my own perspective, if I think about my own life and, you know, the moments in my life where it's been very chaotic or dark and it's hard to really see, you know, oh, I'm, I'm never going to feel good again or, I'm, you know, you're in, a, you're in a rut. And then later down the line, you look back and you go, oh, OK, I, I kind of see why that needed to happen. I see how that helped me progress. It, it helped me get wiser, get stronger. And I like to think that if you look at the collective human uh, group as a single entity we're just going through the developmental stresses and strains of evolving and yes it does mean that there'll, there'll be chaos and uncertainty and very disruptive catalysts that come across and kind of like sweep the rug from under us as a society but are these necessarily um negative uh, elements or are these necessary uh, kind of prerequisites you know is there is there for example an evolutionary pre uh, prerequisite for us to in some way meld spirit and science together connect intuition and logic physics and metaphysics in order for us to uh, progress our perception of reality do we need hemisphere synchronization between what many consider to be opposing worldviews spirit science when in reality perhaps the clearest picture can be divined when these perspectives are in some way married together what do you think Yes, I don't see a duality. And yeah. um, this has been a theme in all of my work, even with the book on purgatory, um, this idea of separating spirit and matter, you know, the separation of spirit and matter, which, um, you know, is, is really just a framework of yeah. perception. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, especially when there's talk of this the ufo you know in the the back engineering of the you know what this is and there's no talk of the weird experiences that a lot of the people who allegedly say they work on the craft um or the the parts and things like that you know their experiences doing that and and the kinds of research that are being done with respect to interfacing with it right as a um you know as a non uh, as a some type of I would call it like, uh, some people call it, um, I can't remember the term that's used by some of the scientists, 
but a, a multi-dimensional object. Yes, so I'm in agreement with you. And I, I think you said that very well, actually. I don't think I can say it better. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, one of the one of the physicists that I was lucky enough to to meet and then and get on the record was Oak Shannon, uh, former special projects manager for Los Alamos, and he said the same thing that we we could be looking at a, a you know a multi dimensional object coming into a, a lower dimensional plane, which is our existence, and perhaps not we're not really getting the full picture from these things, which begs the question as to how you can recover them, which means it could just be a spectrum. I suppose there could literally just be space aliens in spaceships crashing or being shot down or landing. But I do think there's another component to this. You know, to me, the UFO subject is an extremely philosophical and, and metaphysical conversation. There isn't a clear cut distinction between the physical and the metaphysical within this space. Um, because these objects, you know, these UFOs, they behave in ways that seem ethereal. And I think, uh, you know, if you look back on someone like Arthur C. Clarke, his famous statement that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So, you know, I guess, you know, is there space for this to be just sufficiently advanced technology or is there also room for magic? Is there room for a strange melding between, as we just said, science and spirit between our realm and, uh, and the realms beyond it? Or is it simply space aliens in advanced spaceships and we could just be looking at something so incredibly sophisticated that it comes off as uh, spiritual or, or uh, you know, ephemeral in some way? Or could it really be borrowing from the angelic and demonic archetypes of religious teachings? Where, I mean, where do you sit? I know that Jacques Vallée, for example, was having quite a, you know, a battle of, of ideology with himself over what this might represent, kind of looked at the, the Jungian framework of a collective overmind and the ways in which, uh, you know, non-local consciousness as a collective group might be creating these things like manifestations. There are so many different avenues to explore with the, you know, the potential origin of this stuff. Where would you place your cards for the majority of, of UFO experiences? Do you think it's, uh, you know, space aliens or something far, far stranger? Okay, so when you say space aliens, you're talking about... Um... The Alpha Centauri it's, took a few. Yeah, years right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I mean, even that hypothesis, the ET hypothesis, if you think about it, it could also be weird as well. Oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, maybe I'm just coming... maybe I'm just desensitized to it by now, Diana. <laughs> no, I think right. I, both of us are. I think both of us are. Um, first, we have to understand that, like, historically, People don't understand this, I think, contemporary people don't understand that people have always thought about this. So even people back in the day, like, um, you know, Aquinas, say the 12th, you know, the um, uh, scholastic, uh, you know, doctor of the church um, person from, you know, Catholic history was was talking about other worlds and, and you know, quote unquote, people on other worlds. Um Emanuel Swedenborg in the 1700s was speaking about it, even wrote a book about it, said that he had uh, direct communication with people on other worlds as well. And, you know, he, he didn't call them extraterrestrials. He just said that they were people, spirits, you know, angels, things like this. Um, he, had a, he had a huge taxon uh, taxonomy of these beings. Um, Tyler had a taxonomy of these beings as well, which, by the way, changed as I knew him. It, it developed. Okay, so I also discuss this in in encounters when I talk about this idea of hyper objects. So, in a sense, we are at a time when not only are we going into space, like physically, and seeing things that we've never seen before, and even seeing objects that that are so incredibly uh, large that we can't actually see them. We can only see them through a telescope, right? We can only see them through our technology. So there's a mediation between us and these objects. And that's the same thing that's happening digitally. So not only are we going out into space, but we're going in to these screens, into digital environments where we're also, especially quantum environments, where we're dealing with things that we can't possibly understand without use of technology and so technology in a sense has to be our second set of eyes in order to it has to become us in a way to enter these environments 
And so Dr. Whiteley, by the way, is very aware of the kinds of consciousness that accompanies, say, people, astronauts in space, but even pilots and pilots that, that encounter anomalies and things like that. And there is a shift. And not only that, but but anthropologists have been looking at these hyper objects that people, you know, dimensional objects like platonic solids and things like that, that we can only really conceive of through either the language of mathematics or, you know, or modeling through computers and, and you know, and, and getting to these ideas. So this is this is what I'm talking about in terms of this unprecedented time period for us is that we now have the ability to through our technology, you know, see with with a different set of eyes, and it's technology that's that is this uh, this uh, our glasses really, you know, our our glasses, and this does change our consciousness. It does change the way in which we exist. Well said. Do you think that uh, much like the UFO flap that occurred once we detonated the atomic bomb, that a similar type of situation, perhaps even actually greater levels of interest uh, from these non-human actors is occurring as we get closer to what some believe to be the singularity? Could this be a bigger uh, kind of uh, moment in, in evolution that they're trying to observe and, and perhaps interact with? Um, okay, so you're referencing external agents, right? So you're referencing non-human external agents and the control mechanism puppet masters of Jacques Vallée's idea, right? I think that's what you're... I'm just trying to get a, a clarification well, you know, to of... To be honest, more just from whatever perspective you currently have with what this stuff is. I mean, you know, we saw at least what seemed to be a pretty significant uptick in strange things in the sky and things coming over military bases when we were starting to blow up atomic bombs. And it feels like a uh, an increase in, in the volume of either sightings or certainly interest from the US government's happening now as we approach what we were saying before, this weird precipice of a next kind of chapter in human history, which certainly seems to be underpinned by AI rising into prominence. So I just wonder if you feel like this is almost like the second atomic bomb, a, a, another signature propagating out that says, hey, this civilization's just hit another level and maybe they're ready for it. Maybe they're not ready for it. Yeah. So, um, okay. I would have to say that perhaps the reason that we do see an uptick in this is first, the culture of reporting has changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And secondly, we have more things in the sky looking at you know, we have more sensing instruments, right? We not only have people with phones, but we also have drones and, you know, or more drones and satellites and things like that. So we just, we're looking more and I think we're seeing more. So it could be a, almost like a, a, a mass, you know, we're going through a mass kind of like a waking up, like, mm -hmm. or at least not waking up, but, but leaving behind um, perceptions that are old perceptions. And so I would look at it, I would tend to see it that way. And in terms of ascribing external agency to it, I've been looking at this idea of external agents in terms of people like, like the people who founded our space program, not just ours, but the Russian space program, um, as well as people like Tyler or people who are engaged in creating AI and things like this. They often speak of getting information, like the download experience, let's put it that way, that you can find in the the philosophies of Plato, uh, speaking about Socrates and stuff. And also a lot of the math mystics of the ancient Greek time period. Um, they spoke in the same way of this this kind of daimon or this muse. The muse, you know, yeah. Yeah, giving them information. And it wasn't their information. They were These were external agents. And... Mm -hmm. What I found was that a lot of people who do um, brain research, cognitive research, and um, neuroscience into creativity, extreme creativity, find that your frontal, um, ex I guess it's called the executive functioning part of your brain, basically shuts down during this time period. And it appears to the person themselves that this information is being placed into them by some external agent. And they can call it whatever they want. They can call it the goddess Lakshmi. And Ramanujan's, you know, external agent, 
or ET or, okay, so that the name doesn't really matter. What, what matters is this process. So are we then, so to me, it seems like you're suggesting as well as Jacques um, control hypothesis that there is an external agent doing this to us as kind of molding us into this, this idea that, you know, we're, we're evolving and are we ready to make it to this kind of next stage? And so I question the, I guess I question the autonomy of the external agent. Is there really one outside of us or is it just us, <laughs> you know, and we just don't understand what we actually do, you know, the kinds of things that we actually are capable of doing as a species. So just to say that, uh, that's just one, you know, suggestion. Um, another one is that we shouldn't tend, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, we shouldn't think of ourselves as once, you know, we have many various cultures within our species. And some of them have like the texts that in influence us, you and me in this Western world, they don't influence the, the, those other cultures, say indigenous cultures, like indigenous Australians, they already feel like they went through an apocalypse, right? <laughs> they did, you know, they were, their, their culture was almost entirely wiped out, but it, you know, and their culture is very old and most likely would continue. Okay. So, so they're going to have, they're not going to look to the same types of books or precedents. You know, you, you mentioned the matrix and, you know, these kinds of things, uh, almost like a template for us now. And I do see that. And I think it's important for us because I do think, think that it is uh, applicable and it goes back to, you know, it's just a restructuring of Plato's, re Plato's cave, the allegory of the cave. But when you look at the allegory of the cave, there are things even that we don't even pay attention to like the presence of you know the you see in the allegory of the cave the people who are tied up and they're looking at the shadows on the cave and they think that's reality and this person leaves and sees that wow there's something outside the cave and comes and tells his or her friends and they are like you're crazy you're a conspiracy theorist paraphrasing um but but nobody actually talks about who are these people that are tying us up, right? Who are the mm -hmm. people that are actually tying up and creating the show, right? So we never really talk about that. And I think that's probably where we are right now in our society, at least, not in these other societies that are, you know, never had that, that they were never in the matrix, right? Right, and, right. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, we no, I... look at us as very, you know, we're not just one type of species. We have various ways of, of being and we tend to think of ourselves as this monolithic when i say we i'm talking about you know western culture yeah yeah, yeah uk yeah north america yeah. you know but but it's not like that for for most for a good portion of humans it's a great point to make diana and i think you know there's one way of looking at that in terms of the you know our own plato's cave is that yes we are very sophisticated we have our atom smashers and our fusion reactors but there's a group of people in the Amazon basin meeting God every Sunday by drinking a shamanistic brew and being told information about the coming, uh, the coming future of humanity and the, the, the dawning of a new age of consciousness. And so we're, we're in a completely separate universe to other people who are exploring different avenues of thought and even between kind of like Eastern and Western medicine and the yes. of opinion, you know, and the age yeah. of enlightenment and the, the kind of reductionist type of ideas that we have in the West are, are not necessarily shared or even accurate as much as they've propelled us technologically and in a, in a certain type of sophistication, we've lost that conscious sophistication and connection. Yeah, I think so. I think that, I mean, there's probably a connection between the technological development and the, um, the, lo the losing of that type because yeah. you ha almost in a sense... There, there. If you look at, you know, I was looking at my friend's uh, graph, and I was thinking, you know, like people like Max Weber, you know, mentioned that capitalism was created through this idea of the Protestant work ethic, right? right and right. you know, and that's not. Uh, and he said it's definitely not Catholic, <laughs> in the sense that you know he said, and this is very uh, uh, offensive, but you know, the people who were doing this work 
these are the quote unquote fathers of the field of religious studies and anthropology. Um, they were doing this work and they were, you know, they, they were of their time period. So they, they had, you know, racist and sexist, you know, interpretations. And they said, you know, Max Weber was saying Catholics are way too interested in having fun and, you know, and being lazy. And the Protestants are kind of, you know, they'll put off be having a good time in order to create wealth. And so he saw this as kind of the the beginning of, of capitalism, the, the Protestant ethic. So, um, yeah, it's called the uh, the book is called the Disenchantment and the Protestant Ethic. If anybody's interested in following up on that. So you've had a you've had a lot of interactions, obviously, with the the Vatican Church because of your discipline and uh, interactions with its leadership. How familiar with the UFO issue would you say the Vatican Church and and perhaps other powerful faith groups are? And is there any cross pollination between these religious institutions and, for example, Western intelligence communities? Uh, definitely, and they're very aware. Um, my my they follow it absolutely and have their own idea of it and it's not like I, this is exactly what we were talking about a minute ago uh you know there's a vatican type of disclosure and it's not hard to find it's easy but it's not what people in the ufo community expect or want it's an it's not secular and when i say secular you know we look at these craft as you know with the lens of a secular we have a secular lens for looking at it what if they're not that way what if it's not that way um so let's take an example in this country we have what's called the separation of church and state right it's a secular supposedly a secular it's not but say it you know for for the record let's just say okay let's say that it is um it's you know we we tend to keep religion out of it or questions of spirituality out of it right um even the idea of religion is actually a secular idea it's, it was created in a secular environment so that's a binary that's not even i mean we only utilize it in our countries so if you go to say north american indigenous communities first nation communities or australian indigenous communities Religion that is, they don't even use the term, but they're definitely not secular. Okay. They do have ideas of other intelligences and beings and star nations and things like that. So I would suggest that the Vatican is, is similar. They were before any kind of secular Western, I, you know, they're not going to be looking at it in the way in which we're interpreting disclosure or the, or craft. Oh, they definitely have an idea. Absolutely. They would, of course. Their archives are filled with these reports. Well, this is this is it. Uh, this is uh, an avenue I kind of want to walk down with you for a moment. And if I if I said that I believe that the, the Roman Catholic Church or the, the Vatican has essentially played the role of an intelligence community network throughout history, obfuscating disruptive truths, maybe sequestering and classifying historical intelligence that was considered too world changing for the global population would you would you argue against that or would you say that that is an element of uh, of its existence um yes i think that it's not hard to see that i mean right. we've now rec i am not a spokesperson for the catholic church okay i am a practicing catholic and i understand the problems with catholicism okay i'm not like a blind person who just you know accepts a lot of the things that are horrific um within that history um but you know i think that a lot of people have to understand that to consciously keep this idea of being a, a practicing catholic um i do that because i know people who are like my friend sister rose or like you know a lot of the the sisters and monks and people who are actually out there feeding people helping people they don't care about UFOs. They're just doing what they know needs to be done to, to help people. Um, I'm not a Catholic. I don't remain a Catholic because of what I see in the Catholic hierarchy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that should be said. The, the institution what, of power is different to the boots on the ground behavior. 
yeah, and even the mystical elements within right. the, the church, I think that, you know, this also can keep a person in the church, you know, the mystical elements, the transmission of this too. So what I see, I, I absolutely agree with you that there is this element within the church. And that's what I've been saying in terms of looking at especially the formation of the church. And it's, you know, I spend a lot of time when I teach this to my students, I spend a lot of time on the first 300 years of early Christianity, right. because I think that was the most am amazing and revolutionary time period for that. Um, because you create in that small time period, you see a Jewish man probably in a tradition that includes what's called the Merkaba tradition, which is a Jewish, um, it's a Jewish mystical tradition that has to do with chariots. And he's, he's transmitting this to in code, by the way, because he's not, he's very specifically not speaking to, he's speaking to those who can hear. And he says that he says, I'm speaking and I'm speaking in parables. And he's, you know, and his, a lot of times his apostles and disciples are like, what are you talking about? And he's basically saying, all right, listen, you know, I'm doing this for you. I'm, t I'm sharing this to you. And so this is, this takes off like wildfire. Why? Because he's basically, I mean, honestly, it's just like um, a decentralization of power, you know, that. Jewish people in the first century are under a terrible situation with Rome. Rome dominates. Rome is an oppressive military regime that dominates. They crucify people and put them on their roadways. So that when you go to, to Rome, you'll see this and you'll think, okay, I'm not going to mess with Rome. Okay. So here comes this person who's basically teaching his group of people who are Jewish how to survive in Rome, and and he's giving them hope, and he's also opening a completely beautiful world to them, of you know, people look, you know, consider the lilies of the field, you know, they don't work, and you know, but look at them, look at how beautiful, and there is a God, there is a force of good. This is just beautiful, not only to the Jewish people, but to Roman people too, who don't like being subjected to the laws of Rome, and we're talking about actually women. So a lot of the people who convert to early Christianity are Roman women, and they do get killed for it too in the Roman games. So like Perpetua and Felicitas and, you know, these women that we've forgotten. And why have we forgotten them? Well, sadly, because of the, the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> you know, so what happened was that a lot of that history was then taken and and, a, and so a lot of the elements were uh, re you know um what would you call it they were completely reinterpreted yeah and it's a no white wall. yeah yeah or even burned you know oh, and yeah. Yeah, yeah so what i do is i look at the the history of the church and i also look at the history of ufology you know and also the you know what's happening and i think that in the current climate with especially um social media and the internet and things like that Honestly, as a researcher, I can't find certain things that I could easily find even a year ago. So it's this, oh, yeah. it's not, oh, yeah. this won't be like a, an oppressive kind of, you know, let's take away this information and ban these videos and things like that. It's going to be a flooding of social media. It'll be a flooding of the internet with things that are, that will drown out a lot of the revolutionary ideas that go along with, with, I think the U UFO, um, experience, which is very similar to this Merkaba experience, if not the same thing that's happening. I don't know if it's yeah. the same thing, but yeah. it could very well be. And if I may say, there's also an oral tradition that's, that's, um, that's similar. So this oral tradition that then gets passed along is also within the intelligence community. So you have the, you know, you have a lot of the people who are saying, you know, let's get the redacted data, let's get this data. Well, of course, the intelligence communities happen to be intelligent, <laughs> you know, and they know exactly, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. You know, it's going to be something that's passed person to person.
Yeah, it's it, it's a bit like uh, you know a secret society in that regard, and it's just quietly handed down from the worthy to the worthy. And uh, you know, we're seeing, like you say, a little little bit of this starting to leak out into the into the public area, or is you know is leak even a fair fair way to put it? It's being uh, you know curated out perhaps into the public and uh, still trying to understand the real reason behind that. You know, one of my friends sent me a message when I said that I was uh, coming on with you and I'm not sure if this is the right place to put it, but I'm just getting the intuition that it might be in terms of secret societies and the phenomenon and ancient history. He he wanted me to ask you um, what kind of connection you know of between the phenomenon and the Knights of Malta. Okay, so... um. I would say that, okay, so for one thing, the I, I'm not, that's a group that I wouldn't, I'm not a part of. I can't okay. be a part of that group, okay? So, but, um, all right, the Knights of Malta, and there are societies within the Catholic Church that are, you know, during, I don't know how familiar your audience is with the Catholic Church, but during Vatican II, a lot of things happened. And one of the things that happened was some of these very intensive, devout groups um were kind of um i wouldn't say excommunicated but almost excommunicated some of them actually were and then brought back after john paul ii kind of brought them back into the church the latin mass was actually forbidden for a while and there was so much outcry uh about that because that transmission some people felt was in that mass that transmission and so these societies um, believe that they also carry this lineage, this this lineage of transmission. Like a, um, I, you know, in my field, we we don't just study one religion; we study many religions. And I also see this in Buddhist esoteric communities. Like you do see it in different Tibetan Buddhist communities of a lineage of transmission. And in we tend not to think about that in Protestant religion, you know, religions, Protestant denomination of Christianity. But you absolutely see this within Catholicism. You see a transmission. And so these like night of night to model. So let's put it another way. Let's put it away that I hope that now we've cleared some grounds with in terms of understanding that let's move our perspective from the binary of secular religion and religious. And then let's look at this idea of the phenomena as you know say say it is something that has to do with if we look at say somebody like francis of assisi mm. who is a saint within the catholic church probably the most um popular saint and he has a very um he's he had an extraordinary connection with the earth and the environment and non-human intelligence is like animals right so if you you can't pass a garden without often without seeing a statue of him and he's holding you know he's got birds and, you know, and things like that so there's something here and he also had some very interesting interactions with what are described in the primary sources as a flying torch you know a torch that came down and interacted with him well some would say that he was part of this transmission and this merkaba um mysticism merkaba mysticism now i've talked to people who are experts at this mysticism, the Jewish Merkaba mysticism, and they will absolutely hate what I'm saying right now. And um, but but a lot of them, two of them in particular, I've talked with um, at length, agree that this is the case. But they'll say they will never say that publicly, and they will probably hate that I'm saying it as well. And I'm not saying it as an expert in you know Merkaba mysticism, but it looks it looks similar to me if you're looking at the kinds of things that happen, the patterns, you know, a flying torch from the sky coming down, um, actually hurting people in some cases, um, dealing harshly with them um, in the sense, but also changing them in, in a, a transformative way that then gets interpreted as transformational in a way in which the Catholics understand Francis has been transformed and then francis francis um obviously is so charismatic that 
we just still talk about him today. Well, I think about these interpretations because, like you said, it 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 certainly echoed through our theological framework. Uh, you know, encounters with the unknown in various ways, in various forms, from you know the burning bush to the wheels of Ezekiel to everything in between. There has been these uh, encounters, which now, through our particular type of lens, is translated as flying saucers or alien greys. But you know, could this? be the same thing and it's it's interacting subtly and and kind of nudging us in certain directions i think about my own experiences to briefly give you one example of my experiences all of them have been uh from me actually getting into a conscious like kind of meditative state in my backyard and projecting the intention so a lot of people know about that through what's called ce5 i don't follow any sort of particular regimen with it i just um through a very strange synchronistic coincidental journey arrived at the realization personally that yes this works i believe it works and i went out with full intention that it works and there is a backstory to that but just for time's sake i'll just say at this point i was very secure in my belief that this was possible and i was going out into my backyard getting into a very basic meditative state and just project projecting this intention that i'd like to see something what I ended up having um, occur in 2019 in August was I had three of these orange orbs of light zip across the sky at high speed, stop on a dime above uh, my property high up in the sky. They began to descend down towards my house, kind of weaving like this around each other as they came down, and they uh, froze about five feet above the roof of my house, these kind of basketball-sized, slightly transparent orange orbs of light. And, I, you know, I think about an experience like that and you take it thousands of years ago and that would have been you know the angels of god coming down to greet me from the heavens and that's how i would have interpreted that experience at that time so it makes me wonder if we really are dealing with just the same phenomena with lots of different faces do you think that's the case in certain instances yes i do think that's the case and that is a controversial thing to say actually in my field okay yeah and um another person who does think this as well but doesn't like to reduce it um, is Jeffrey Kripal at Rice uh -huh. University. He, yeah, he's so you know, so he's basically, and I I agree. Um, we actually had the same ideas at the same time, and we're shocked. You mm. know, this was in 2011, 2012, that you know because he's all he also comes from the Catholic uh, tradition, um, and although that's not what he studied at graduate school, but that's his tradition, and so we both looked at a lot of these elements within the catholic history and it appears you know i do actually um i've written a lot about this comparison and it's all actually it's free and it's on my academia edu website all you need is a password to get to it you just use uh make a password and and it's called uh the ufo the uh ufo and purgatory it's like a comparison so a lot of those things were like those orbs were interpreted as souls from purgatory right and that's actually how i i started to study ufos is because there were so many reports of these orbs that would go through people's you know nun cell for example or things like that and i didn't know what they were i didn't think they were ufos or anything like that i actually just didn't know and so i had a whole catalog of those things and that's how i started to study modern day reports of ufos so i definitely think that i think that there are a lot of things though there are a variety of these types of things but i do think that you can make the case that yeah what we saw you know what we just have a different different interpretive framework um i know a police officer actually a police chief who or um uh what would you call them sergeant a captain um somebody who's high up in the police in the um california who as a very, you know, I've known this person my whole life, um, had this experience of an orange orb mm. that when he was around 11 years old, followed him and chased him while he was on his bicycle. And, um, and now he's seen, and then he had similar experiences of people who have, um, you know, see visitors in their room at night and things like that. And this person would never talk about this experience and never talk about these things but because I i've known this person my whole life i witnessed that the kinds you know first i witnessed who he was in his character and i also witnessed 
his, which was, you know, an incredibly good person here and a standout person and, and his reticence to talk about it. Now he's watched almost all of Gary Nolan's interviews and he's able to now think about what happened to him in a way, you know, that in a way that makes him feel better about it, even though to him, it was a traumatic experience to him, right? He wasn't thinking of CE5 at all. No, no. You know, CE5 was not around when he was 11 years old. He was terrified. And so, you know, what's happening in a sense is helping a lot of people. That person included a lot of people who are good people and who knew that if they said anything about their experiences, that their jobs were in jeopardy. You know, these are the, these, these are the people who are being helped. And I told Gary that too. I said, Gary, you know, you're getting a lot of flack. <laughs> you're getting a lot, you know, but what you're doing is helping many people, many good people. Yeah, because it it just gives people the space to feel like they're again not alone, um, and uh, there's you know a level of credibility assigned to people who have uh, a very uh, high level career and come out and say, "Hey, look, I've had my own experiences with this. It is real." And uh, you know, I almost think sometimes with this uh, with the with this phenomena and these experiences. It, it could be a little bit like someone giving you a psychedelic and you don't really know what it is and you take it and go, oh, well, what can I expect? And well, probably a bit of a traumatic experience because you're not ready <laughs> yes. for that type of thing. <laughs> right, right. Versus, versus going into it with reverence and understanding and like, okay, I'm going to learn something from this experience. And, and I think maybe if you're caught unawares with something so novel, so kind of reality bending, it could be a very traumatic experience to integrate into your life. Um, I do think that there is some level of uh, almost neural genesis that seems to occur when you have an experience with the phenomena because your brain, I guess, has to either accept or reject what it's just experienced. So if you reject it, it will probably crystallize as a form of trauma for you. And if you accept it, it could potentially open your mind up to a wider sense of reality. And, uh, you know, absent a definitive explanation of what's really going on with this phenomena, I feel like what you can say at face value just by it existing is that it challenges all our preconceptions of the laws of physics and what's in, what's in reality, how consciousness behaves. All of these things seem to be wrapped up neatly with a tied bow with the UFO. It's kind of hovering above us as this example of all the impossible things we thought were impossible being made possible. So it, it has, I guess, inherent within it, with exposure some form of neural genetic effect in the brain and uh you know i guess could either make or break someone's psychology yes i think so and i also think that um like i i noticed that um this is a conversation i had with tyler when we worked together and we noticed that there were people who really really wanted to study the artifacts or you know the alleged artifacts or you know or have you know um, interface with the phenomenon and things like that. And, but they, they didn't. And we noticed some people who didn't really care or want interface or even come, you know, into the programs to study some of these things and, and they did. And so we started to notice what they, you know, the difference and it appeared to be that a character difference, a difference in character. And so I pursued this line of, of, inquiry with one of the people of, in the new book and we discussed that you know that in traditional societies like um i do have some people that i engaged with um through someone who was like an interpreter um the um people in indigenous australians in of the martu uh indigenous community and they have a lore and they definitely have a lore of these beings but only certain people can actually be initiated into that lore. And I thought that was similar to what we were seeing, Tyler and I were seeing, like there were only certain people who could actually do this. And it, it had to do with a certain type of honesty, not even a goodness really, but a type of honesty. And so a friend of mine was suggesting to me, who's this person who's very intelligent and works with AI, um, suggested that it works like a crypt it works cryptographically that it's almost as if there are, um, you know, there's a key 
And the key happens to be something that we never, that traditional religious community in the West would recognize is that it's character. If character is a certain way, it works as a key to to walk into right. these kinds of experiences. I like but it's that. definitely not for, yeah, I mean, it would be a cool thing, right? Then just be a better person. And <laughs> But well, I don't I don't know if it's the case, but I'm just saying that this is the preliminary looking at this. It, it certainly, at least from my own experiences, feels like intention is so important, at least in terms of like actually trying to engage with this phenomena and, and elicit a response from it. Because as you said, it, it's not necessarily even about being a good person. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got plenty of my own issues. And as a human, I'm, I'm 28 years old. I'm still figuring out how to be an adult. You know what I mean? So like, I, you know, there's ego and there's all these issues. And I'm, I'm saying to people, look, I know my platform is called Project Unity, but I'm not a saint. Don't expect me to always be a saint. And so I don't think it's about necessarily that kind of like, oh, he's a, he or she is some devout saint like person. No, it's it's clarity of vision. It's intention. And because of, like I said, I had this weird synchronistic journey that led to the concept of contact clicking into place in a way that felt like a, an answer from the universe. You know, to very quickly tell you, I, I was basically sitting on my bed one night and just saying out loud to the universe, like all of these things I've been learning about consciousness and quantum mechanics and what might happen after death, like I'm fascinated by it, but I, I, how does this improve my life? Like, how does this change anything in my life? Give me something to do. Please give me something to work with that proves these concepts in in some form of way that I can actually do myself. And then a week later, uh, this is before I was even interested in UFOs, so that was not on my conscience. A week later, uh, my my best friend is like, hey, you need to watch this uh, documentary, Unacknowledged by Dr. Stephen Greer. First ever introduction to the UFO subject, watch the documentary. Obviously, it introduces some of the the military guys and you know the Minutemen missile officers and people that go, oh, okay, that seems pretty legit. That's interesting. So it started me down that curious thread with UFOs. But it's near the end of that documentary where he says about this idea of being able to uh, you know elicit some form of a contact scenario through getting into meditative states. And that right there was a light bulb for me because of the previous week and basically requesting oh, something. Oh, interesting. Me. Yeah. I truly think that was the definitive right. reason why I was able to do it. Because I went out like basically like a zealot. I had no doubt. I had like absolutely no doubt that was a answer from the universe and it worked mm -hmm. and changed my life direction. So I think, you know. It's not about being some perfect exemplar of a human being who's operating a higher consciousness 24-7, but it's the ability to refine the signal, the noise and the signal in human consciousness and intention and belief. You know, we're, we, as you would know from your studies, we are ritualistic uh, creatures and ritual um, and, uh, you know, kind of creating almost like a, a way to hack the algorithm in a sense by right where well, we put this here and we, we we sing from this particular text and then we do this and then we do that we we put these places in motion it's not necessarily the objects or the incantations it's your belief in them that actually seems to be the uh the kind of the key the keystone and so i yeah i would say that it's it's intention with this type of contact methodology which is why it's basically the worst thing in the world for skeptics it's like well i don't believe in it it's like well, you're never going to see it then well oh, that, that's convenient that's very convenient that because i don't believe it i'm not going to see it and it's like yeah buddy I, buddy I don't know what to tell you it kind of feels like that might be one of the prerequisites here it's a difficult one to figure out for sure yeah yeah i think so wow that's that's really interesting and i agree with you um when people look at the history of saints when do you start to get into study about this. I saw this when I was in graduate school because I, I actually, my master's program was um, at the Jesuit School of Theology, uh, taking classes at UC Berkeley, doing a kind of an academic right. degree with priests in formation, by the way. So these were Jesuit priests in, um, in formation. And what I saw was that we would do a deep dive into the primary sources for a lot of the saints. And the saints turned out to be not so holy, you know, in the sense right. that we think of them as being super holy, right? And, you know, this challenged their belief system so much. Some people actually dropped out of wow. their seminary. And so I got to see that. But, I mean, it never actually impacted me and my faith because, you know, I, I knew there was something. But I just didn't, I just knew that I was, I was supposed to learn about this. And so, you know, 
so I think this is a, a key idea that there it's not about the what our preconceived notions of you know th- does this person go to church every day or every week right. and you know is this no it, that's not what it's about in fact if we study communities of monastics and, and you know in all the religious traditions we get some really interesting pictures and if you study the people who are like the high functioning people in this space program um, you get some pretty interesting pictures very similar to the monastic practices and they're a lot of them have to do with lifestyle choices um you know and you know i actually have talked a lot about this because people ask me about the protocols you know what are these protocols that tyler did well these are like the monastic protocols and yeah they'd actually work and maybe some people have said oh you have to be ocd to follow those okay you know don't follow them i'm not trying to make anybody follow them i'm just do i'm just interested in this type of you know connection that that some people have with like the saint francis connection i guess you could yeah. call it yeah well i mean it's 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 pe- different strokes for different folks i mean some people will listen to binaural isochronic tones and be like oh my god it, it reverberated my astral form right out of my body another person will say it just sounds like my refrigerator running you know right like, right it doesn't yeah mean anything to me and they're just closed off to it so it's it, there's going to be something for everyone and not everything's going to be for everyone so you know, I always uh, try and keep an open mind when it comes to like, for example, you know, this whole idea of making contact. I'm like, look, I can't tell people how to do that kind of stuff. It worked a certain way for me. Perhaps it will work like that for you if you're of a similar mind. But if you're not, it's probably a different method to uh, to achieving this. But, you know, what, what struck me as just so profound is it is achievable. And it brings up a lot of questions about human consciousness, about non-locality of consciousness. And uh, and how the universe kind of does seem to respond to this concept of manifestation and animism, I suppose, that everything is uh, in some way ambiently aware and responsive. Obviously, then you have the quantum side of it where it looks like we literally collapse photons and electrons into position yeah. just by yeah. existing. Uh, yeah. You know, so yeah, everything's starting think... to feel like a simulation, spiritual or otherwise. You know, this idea of um, animism is... Um... A friend of mine reframed that for me and said, in my community, we call that molecular intelligence. Mm, I like that. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about, okay, so obviously, you know, trees have like literally like a infrastructure for, yes. you know, a communication and things like that. But what about things like, you know, um, your couch or, you know, yeah. like you mentioned your refrigerator, things like that. And my friend said, oh, no, those have their own way of being too and it's called molecular intelligence. And so um, so that's like a, a, the scientist form of animism, I think. Yeah, I like that. I could almost imagine, I mean, unless there is some weird alternate dimension inside the perception of a refrigerator where it's going to work and stuff like that, which I kind of doubt. I don't think it's the same kind of situation. I would almost imagine that that type of ambient consciousness is almost like, I'm just happy to be aware. I'm just an awareness that's happy to be aware. I'm serving the purpose of being a molecule inside a molecule inside of a, a scaffolding. And it's just kind of like a baseline ambient consciousness just kind of knows that its job is to keep going because it's keeping the whole thing running, basically. I mean, that's just an interpretation, but I can't imagine it's kind of sitting there, each molecule going, gosh, this is a pretty boring existence, isn't it? Just being a part of a refrigerator or something like that. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Probably a different slice of awareness to a human being in that sense. But uh, no, I, I, I do hold to that. And I think my experience is reinforced, at least to, a, to some level, uh, a perception of faith that there is this type of uh, intelligence that's weaving things together. As I think Albert Einstein said that he can see the clock, but can't envision the clockmaker. It's too... Right large it's too complex and uh and we're in a very interesting time period right now where we're starting to maybe connect some of these foundational dots through science through hopefully a resurgence of spirit which is what gives me a lot of hope that psychedelic research is coming back into play i don't know if you saw any of the uh, panel talks from the extended state dmt trials that came out recently amazing yeah <laughs> i it's almost unbelievable yeah it's very interesting very novel stuff happening in the consciousness realm, novel stuff happening in the quantum physics realm, non-human intelligence being discussed, as I said before, and as we were talking about, does feel like we're in some sort of a chapter change. I don't want to keep you for too much longer. This has been a really, really great talk, though. I'm so glad that you took a little bit more time to, to kind of dig into some of this uh, 
more philosophical territory. I like, this is my territory. I like exploring the, the thoughts and the ideas around this stuff, you know? Yeah, I do too. And um, thank you so much for having me on. <laughs>